Welcome. We're pleased you're with us. My name is May Cannon with Churches for Middle East Peace, and we're here to talk about Jerusalem. Tomorrow, for those of us who are Christians in the United States and around the world, Lent begins, and many of us will be turning our eyes to Jerusalem. And so we wanted to start out this series that's called Jerusalem, the Holy City in Crisis by talking to one of the foremost experts on the city of Jerusalem, Danny Seidemann. He's an Israeli attorney um, with extensive experience, a graduate of Cornell and Hebrew University. He's a retired reserve major in the Israeli Defense Forces, an active member of the Israeli Bar Association. He was awarded the title of an honorary member of the Order of the British Empire in recognition of his work on the city of Jerusalem. So I'm glad you're here, Danny. Thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Yes, good. Well, I'm interested to hear, I just was in the region in December and since Trump's announcement about the recognition of Jerusalem, I'd love for you to brief our audience, if you could, about the implications of that decision and what's happened since then. And then we're really eager to hear your analysis and what work we can do now to try to counterbalance some of the current political shifts and tides that we're seeing. So I'd love to just hear from you about what's happening there. Okay, look, Jerusalem um, and the recognition of Jerusalem came in the service of what I call is a mantra. And the mantra is Jerusalem, the undivided capital of Israel that would never be redivided, which is one word and a noun, and you have to be able to recite it seven times in a row in order to get the Republican nomination for president. And before we enter into the question of recognition, I would like to put that to a reality check. Is Jerusalem an Israeli city? Well, there are about 540,000 Israelis living in Jerusalem. It's the largest Israeli city in the country. It is the second largest Jewish city in history. New York still beats us. It is two and a half times larger than ever it was in the past. The last time was about the time of the life of Jesus, when there were 200,000 people living in Jerusalem. But I will let you in on a secret. Um, not all of the residents are Israeli. Um, about 320,000 of them are Palestinian. Now, there are Palestinian citizens of Israel. There are Israeli Palestinians. And those of you who have been to Nazareth or to Jaffa or to the Bedouin and the Negev, they're Palestinian, but they are full citizens of Israel. That's not the case with the Palestinians of East Jerusalem. They're politically disempowered. They do not have the right to vote in national elections. Um, they do not have Israeli passports. Uh, they are politically disempowered. And they're 37, 38% of the population. Jerusalem, before 1967, was an Israeli city and a Palestinian city and a divided city. Today, it's a binational city in which there are two national collectives, one with political rights and the other without. And that raises Lincolnian associations, a house divided against itself, cannot stand, half occupied, half free. Is Jerusalem an undivided city? Well, you know, there are barriers on the perimeter of Jerusalem, none inside the city. But I, as an Israeli, can't go to 90% of East Jerusalem uh, without assuming ri uh, risks that I'm not willing to assume. It's physically dangerous. Uh, and across the street from my office is a cafe where all of the Palest all of the baristas are Palestinian young men. They can't go, they're not allowed to go after dark to the dumpster alone because there are vigilantes picking on them. Uh, Jerusalem is more divided today than ever it was in the past. Now, is Jerusalem the capital of Israel? Well, for me it is because I'm an Israeli and that's fine with me, but would you like to see all of the embassies in Jerusalem? I can show it to the, you all of them right here and now. There are none. Even Trump didn't move the embassy here. He could have, but he didn't. And the only, countries that followed Trump uh, in recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel are the countries who names you can't remember. Uh, at the moment, I can't, you know, I, I you know, Micronesia, because that's got a cool name. <laughs> so 
uh, Jerusalem, the undivided capital of Israel, after 50 years of Israeli rule, Jerusalem is more binational, less sustainable, more divided, and more contested than ever before. Now, what did the Trump recognition contribute to Jerusalem? I can poke my head outside the window and I can tell you it's not less divided, it's not less contested, it's not more sustainable, and I had not seen people dancing in the streets. The major consequence of this is that the United States has disqualified itself as a fair broker in any potential deal between Israel and the Palestinians. And the question, there are a few questions. Is What is it that Israel needs? I think Israel needs embassies. I think Israel needs that, uh, recognition. But I also know the only way that we will get that is by recognizing the Palestinians. There will be tens, perhaps hundreds, of embassies in Israeli Jerusalem the day after we open our embassy in Palestinian East Jerusalem, their capital, and they open theirs in Israeli Jerusalem. Hair will sprout on the palm of my hand before other embassies will come here. Uh, Israel also needs assistance in confronting the greatest threat to Israel and the greatest threat to the Palestinians, which are one in the same threat. And here I agree with the former commander of the Mossad, our intelligence agency, who said, Israel is confronting only one existential threat in this generation. It's not Iran, it's not Hezbollah, we can handle that. It is occupation. And Israel desperately needs to end occupation in a way that's compatible with our national interests, as the Palestinians need to end occupation. Um, nobody can do it instead of us, but we can't do it alone. And at the moment, the role that the United States has played since 1967 as a broker, since Secretary of State Rogers, through Kissinger, through Carter, through Baker, and always with Dennis Ross, um, has been shattered. And there's nothing to, to um, replace it. So we are now in a situation where the political platform for addressing grievances, controlling conflict has been shattered. There is nothing to replace it yet. We may see something emerge. I'm sure we will see something emerge. The United States to all intents and purposes has abandoned the two state solution. Uh, Netanyahu is doing everything in his power willfully and systematically to make that solution impossible. Um, I would describe the situation rather succinctly in the following way. We are in a vehicle. There are no brakes. There's no steering wheel. The laws of traffic no longer apply. We don't know the destination and the driver is an adolescent with a learner's permit and a personality disorder. Aside from that, we're in great shape. <laughs> well, let me take you back to where you began, if I may. So you were talking about um, the, the disagreement that you have with the idea that Jerusalem, you know, the, the, returning to this idea of an undivided Jerusalem. Part of my understanding of the Trump announcement at the beginning of December is the argument that the administration made that they were just acknowledging the truth that is, you know, all that the major Israeli government institutions are in Jerusalem. You know, they just said they're stating the obvious, it's pragmatic, et cetera. And I hear you saying that you fundamentally disagree. Can, can oh, you absolutely. Talk I, I think that. Yeah. Look. Um, the undivided Jerusalem is an article of faith that cannot survive empirical scrutiny. Sure, are you, know, you, you do not create international legitimacy, a united and viable city with hollow gestures. You have to look at the geopolitical realities and the urban realities. And no, what we saw was a, 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 um, 
an escape into a parallel universe, united Jerusalem does not exist in nature. It, it may be a wonderful idea. It may be something that can be accomplished in the future. But anybody who takes a hard look at the city sees occupation. And if you do not understand that East Jerusalem is occupied, you cannot possibly begin to fathom what the city is about and to address the issues that need to be addressed. Jerusalem is divided as perhaps no other city on, on earth. Um, and putting a plaque on a building and saying it's an embassy or allocating millions of dollars to build a building is not going to change that reality. The United States did not contribute one bit to the unification of Jerusalem. The United States engaged in a colossal act of self-marginalization in a manner in which American foreign policy allowed itself to uh, go off into a parallel universe, into a Jerusalem that merely does not exist. Mm. And you, more than almost anyone I know, with your mapping of Jerusalem and your work with terrestrial Jerusalem, you know the intricacies of the city in terms of which ones are Israeli and which ones are Palestinian. I mean, how pragmatic is it, as you talk about ending the occupation in East Jerusalem being the future capital of the Palestinian state? I mean, historically, this has been a final status issue. Is that still, I mean, is, is that reality a possibility for the future, or is that just... I mean, are there any long-term repercussions on us returning to that direction with this statement from the U.S.? Well, you know, President Trump said we took Jerusalem off the table. Right, in Davos. I have news. I, I have news for President Trump. There ain't no table. <laughs> and Jerusalem's not getting, it's not being taken off the table. Um, the major existential challenge to the Jewish and Israeli people in this generation and the Palestinian people are one and the same, a reasonable end to occupation. Occupation ends in one way. It ends in a border. And that border will be inside Jerusalem and not around Jerusalem. It is possible to destroy that possibility. We perhaps have already done it. I hope not. Destroying that option does not create an alternative out of the op out of the ashes. Now, I am not oblivious to the grave circumstances in which we live. I think it is quite possible that I will not live to see the end of occupation. Um, I have educated to the best of my ability my three daughters to try and complete the work because there is no alternative. Um, but we have never been closer to the loss of the very possibility of the one imperfect way of addressing the issues of an occupation that optimally will address the national interests of both sides. We're very close to losing it. Right, right. And one of the things I hear you saying is a repercussion of the Trump announcement in December was the um, removing, you know, abandoning uh, the possibility that the U.S. could be a part of the negotiations, removing themselves from the ability to be able to broker anything. I mean, is that a bad thing for the U.S. to be out of that? I mean, in terms of the Palestinians aren't willing to sit, you know, with the U.S., um, calling for peace talks, et cetera. And then Trump just this week said he doesn't think Netanyahu is willing to sit at the table, which you've said there's no table anyway. I mean, is it really a bad thing for the U.S. to not be engaged and not be at the forefront? Look, what starts in Jerusalem doesn't stay in Jerusalem. Um, Jerusalem and Israel-Palestine is the location where the tectonic plates of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam crunch up against each other in a very limited space, where the tectonic plates of the Arab world and the West meet up. 
if there will be a hemorrhaging interface between Israelis and Palestinians and among Jews, Christians, and Muslims in Jerusalem, that will spill over. And that spillover undermines not only vital American interests internationally, ultimately I think it will be an issue, as I was told by one of the generals in the Pentagon, this is a homeland security in, in, issue as well in the United States. Um, I don't think that American an American monopoly over political processes is absolutely essential. I think that American leadership is irreplaceable and that leadership has currently been forfeited and it's not coming back anytime soon. I believe that that is something that is very contrary to the national interests of the United States. Mm -hmm. Okay, now thank you for that. Um, Talk to us a little bit, you mentioned Jerusalem being a center for the three pri primary Abrahamic traditions. You're working on a project on shared Jerusalem and its significance to these, uh, the religious holy sites, even the mapping of Jerusalem is significant. How do we acknowledge the historic Jewish ties to the land um, you know, for millennium? And how do we acknowledge the sacredness of Haram al-Sharif and the Temple Mount to Muslims? And of course, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the sacred sites for Christians is uh, the dynamic, it, I mean, one of the things we talk about is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not a religious war, and yet I hear you saying Jerusalem is so sacred, it has such religious significance. What's your perspective about those dynamics? Now, it, it, Jerusalem has a reputation of being sort of sacred nitroglycerin. Every random bump in the road is going to make it ignite, and that is an undeserved uh, a reputation. Um, as a matter of routine, you will see a very sober, pragmatic interface between the faith communities in Jerusalem. If you sit at the fourth station of the cross um, on El Wad Street, Rehov uh, by the way, which was stolen by the Armenian Catholics a few years back and moved 10 or 20 yards closer to their souvenir stand, uh, we Israelis and Palestinians do not have a monopoly on misbehavior in Jerusalem. Uh, sitting there, you will see thousands of um, Jews coming from the ultra-Orthodox neighborhoods to the Western Wall, thousands of Muslim worshipers um, uh, heading towards Haram al-Sharif and Al-Aqsa for their prayers, and Christians of various denominations, Latin, Protestant, um, um, uh, Orthodox, uh, in the footsteps of Jesus along the Via Dolorosa. It's not touchy-feely. It's not fuzzy warm. When people look at each other, it's often with disdain and contempt, but it works. What we've been witnessing over the last 20 or 30 years is the ascendancy of those faith communities weaponize faith, um, whose claims to Jerusalem are exclusive, exclusionary, absolute. Now, this is not a harangue about keeping religion out of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is Jerusalem because of God, whether she exists or not. Saying keep religion out of Jerusalem is like saying keep finance out of Manhattan and culture out of Florence. That is not the issue. What we're talking about is the marginalization of the traditional religious establishments, be they Jewish, Christian, or Muslim, and the ascendancy of exclusionary settlers who aspire to uh, recreate a biblical kingdom in Silwan and Sheikh Jarrah and the Mount of Olives, or the Temple Mount movement that aspires to radically change the status quo on the Temple Mount or rebuild the temple. You have it among the, the Muslims, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, whose claims uh, to Jerusalem are no less exclusionary, and they aspire to a religious war for their own reasons. And then you have the end of days dispensationalist evangelical Christians for whom Jerusalem has turned into an Armageddon playground. And Sarah Palin can see the Temple Mount from her front porch in Alaska. 
Um, so we are now seeing the ascendancy of the religious pyromaniacs in Jerusalem and the marginalizations of the forces of moderation. And what is necessary is the reestablishment of the credibility and the supremacy of a multi-faith Jerusalem. I have, I'm secular, okay? I eat kosher food when starvation is the alternative, okay? Uh, but I understand that there is this imperative that the faith equities of Jerusalem be scrupulously protected. Uh, this is not interfaith. It's not an attempt to reconcile the conflicting and contradictory theologies of various faiths. This is about the ability of Jerusalem to speak in multiple voices, where nobody is required to apologize for his or her connection to the city. Nobody, uh, no connection, however deep, justifies undermining the established status quo. Nobody is entitled to deny or to denigrate the faith of the other. It's the compatibility or, or it, it's the cohabitation of contradictory religious faiths and narratives. Jerusalem knows how to do that. But we have forfeited the high ground to those who are doing precisely the opposite. And that is dangerous for the Christian community more than others, being the most vulnerable. And secondly, it threatens to transform a political conflict which is informed by religious issues. Um, but ultimately, a conflict that can be solved and transforming that into a religious conflict which cannot be solved of holy war, jihad, milchemet mitzvah, Armageddon, second coming, hopefully in that order, and then we can all pack our bags and go home, except for us, we're already home, and then what the hell do we do? Well, and I think that's a great question. We have a number of people who are watching. This is a live video. We'll make it available for people afterward, of course. And so they have the opportunity to email us questions. So in just a minute, I'll open it up and see if they have specific questions for you, Danny. But I hear you saying that the ultimate problem is the occupation. And the only way that there could be peace in Jerusalem is for there to be a separation, to acknowledge that this is a divided city, sacred to these different faith traditions. I mean, it sounds to me if a border is the only way to end the occupation or the primary way to end the occupation, that's a negotiated peace agreement issue, right? I mean, that brings me to the question of what can we do? What, what, what types of things can we do to um, preserve? I mean, we're working very strongly with a number of the local churches on the ground on the issue of the status quo and responding to, you know, the letter of the heads of churches in Jerusalem that came out in December. Uh, and then there was another one last September and last spring about the concerns of the shifting status quo and the um, influx of the radical settler movement in the old city of Jerusalem. And, you know, there's all these kinds of, um, I don't know if there's symptoms of the problem or, or specific or acute um issues that need to be addressed. But if if the major issue is a political one, then what role do other people play? I mean, particularly the vast majority of us watching would be uh, Christians or constituents mm -hmm. of peace. You know, what are your I, words to add? Look, it, it's a great question. Look, most of the issues on the agenda between Israelis and Palestinians can be solved by a scalpel. Mm -hmm. We need radical surgery. Radical surgery is a border. It is also clear that Jerusalem and particularly the old city and the Holy Sites, that ain't real estate. <laughs> that you cannot remax the old city of Jerusalem. Um, the old city of Jerusalem is the depository of sanctity and sacred memory. And that cannot only be addressed by geographical separation or borders. And there will be a need to address these concerns regardless of the political outcome. I would say the following. Number one, it is imperative to maintain the spiritual and material well-being of the Christian communities in Jerusalem that are doubly and triply vulnerable. And I'm not accusing Israel, I'm not accusing the Palestinians, but there are more Christian um, uh, Jerusalemites in Chicago than there are in Jerusalem. And there is a very real danger that 
Christianity is not going to disappear. It will turn into a museum piece rather being, than being what I understand for believing Christians to believe that the Christian community tracing its roots back to the time of Christ is a living testimony to the life and death of Jesus as they perceive it. That's being threatened. Um, just recently, the municipality of Jerusalem said, we're going to be taxing church properties in ways we didn't do in the past. Bad. That has to be pushed back on. That's, that's number one. Number two, the political processes on Israel and Palestine have been flawed for more reasons than I can possibly mention. But one of them is, it's been run by devout secularists like myself. People who uh, don't understand the symbolic resonance of the symbolic resonance of the city. Uh, and consequently, they did not address the concerns and the needs of faith communities. That makes for bad peacemaking, bad agreements, and it also, alien, also alienates people of faith who otherwise would be very favorably disposed to political processes. Most of the enemies of peace you abuse religion to justify their opposition, but most of the pe believers in this world are favorably disposed to peace, but their concerns have not been addressed. And finally, breathing space. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you a story that I, I feel at liberty to tell. I guess it was three years ago. I took a few of your lunsmen, your compatriots out and around in Jerusalem, three senators, um, John McCain, Lindsey Graham, and Senator Brasso from Wyoming to take a look at Jerusalem. And at the end, Senator McCain asked me, what do you want from me? What do you want from us? I said, look, I don't expect you to vote in a certain way at the moment. I don't expect you to make a speech. And I don't think I can convince you in a three hour outing on a Shabbat afternoon. But you know damn well that the discussion that we had in Jerusalem today would be politically suicidal in Washington. You are a member of the most prestigious club in the world. Why are you allowing yourself to be bullied into this parallel world of the United Jerusalem that doesn't exist? It's not good for Israel. It's not good for the Palestinians. It's not good for the United States. For far too long, the discourse on Israel-Palestine in Christian North America has been dominated by a large minority of end-of-days evangelical Christians. And please do not misunderstand me. By no means all evangelicals. Uh, and a small group of Israel bashers who do not seek the end of occupation, but they seek the end of Israel. Most Christians with whom I'm familiar in the United States, perhaps I'm wrong, care about the Holy Land, care that the Holy Land is being violated and desecrated by conflict, are pro-Israel and also concerned about the Palestinians, create breathing space for them, create ways for them to buy in. Um, there's an interesting development that's taking place in the United States, in the American Jewish community, in the Christian community in the United States, in Europe and in Israel. Default lines have changed. It's no longer left, right, and center. It is now between a certain kind of alt-right, settler right, very ideological, very problematic right wing. And the traditional right wing, center and left, uh, who are finding ways of discussing things that did not exist in the past. That gives us opportunities. Mm -hmm. And um, the real schism is between alt-right, settler-right, ultra-nationalist, and those who are willing to take a hard look at the realities. And that 
provides an opportunity to engage on Israel-Palestine. And one of the ways that I think is most promising are those who use their faith as a way of entering into this conversation. That's so helpful. And I think, you know, we've been um, connected and, and uh, in relationship for a number of years. And I think, you know, so much of our work is about trying to create that space in the U.S. context. What does it mean for us to be able to say that we ultimately care about the legitimate security needs of Israel while ending the occupation? And what does it mean that we can advocate for Palestinian human rights in a way that's not detrimental to the Jewish community in Israel. Um, and mm -hmm. so you've been a wonderful coach to us in that regard. Do you have time to take a couple questions before I let you go? Absolutely, um, absolutely. The, good, thank you, thank you. And you have such insight, Danny, I so appreciate it. Um, one of the things you talked about is Jerusalem being like on these two plates and the potential of an earthquake and you know the significance of the city that even if the U.S. is not directly involved, the repercussions and rumblings, if there's violence in Jerusalem or if the conflict were to escalate, you know, would certainly have um, significant repercussions. Um, with that in mind, one of the great criticisms of the, Trump, of the Trump decision at the beginning of December, our understanding is that initially it was not supported by Secretary Tillerson, that even the U.S. Secretary of Defense, General Mattis, was against the decision because of the security threat that this you know, claim could make. And so there was all of this talk about escalating violence. And then when I was in the region just a couple weeks ago, it was like Jerusalem was silent. It was so quiet. And so one of the things we've been hearing in the aftermath is, look, there was all this worry that violence would escalate. Violence hasn't escalated. So that's not a legitimate argument. Um, and so I'm eager to hear, you know, is uh, the escalation of violence really a threat? Um, and does the Trump administration's acknowledgement of Jerusalem, you know, as the capital of Israel contribute to that? I believe that, and I'm, I'm by that you can go back and check this uh, from the get-go, uh, from la uh, uh, before Trump's inauguration, we argued strongly against um, moving the embassy in recognition. But we did not say that it was going to immediately cause a conflagration. Uh, the detonators of convulsive violence are generally not the geopolitical issues. It's usually the threat to sacred space in and around the Temple Mount, the Rama Sharif, and things of that nature. Having said that, it does not mean that this is uh, uh, anything but a major destabilizing event. I don't think that there has ever been a period in the years that I've been dealing with this that is more imbued with hopelessness. And hopelessness generates um, instability. Sometimes living in Jerusalem is like living in Los Angeles. You can feel the pressure on the tectonic plates building under your feet. We are in a state of acute disequilibrium. You, know, you want an expression of this? We have arrested about 10%, we Israel, of all of the Palestinian boys between the ages of 12 and 18 in the last three years. That's a staggering number. And they're, they're, they're clashing with the police. Why are they doing that? Because they have no future. Um, it is not an accident that the second intifada broke out weeks, months, short few months after the collapse of the Camp David process in 2000. We are in a state of acute disequilibrium. That disequilibrium will be re, will be addressed either by a credible and serious political process, the prospects of which are nil at the moment, or by an outbreak of convulsive violence. There is a war waiting to break out. It just has not yet decided where, when, and over what. It could be with Hezbollah in the north or with Syria. It could be Palestinian forces who yesterday saved 
to Israeli soldiers from a Palestinian lynch mob, that might not happen anymore. And those security forces may turn their weapons on our security forces. It could be an outbreak of violence in Gaza, which is about to boil over. Um, so it was incorrect to expect an immediate impact of you know, a detonator. The final word has not been said. Okay. I have two more questions before we let you go. Um, one of them is about the taxing on the church properties. Um, we had heard that that was proposed legislation at the Knesset. Here's the question. What are the implication of the Jerusalem mayor's attempt to tax church properties? Is that legal under Israeli law? It's a great question. And the, and the answer is I, I, I've been trying to figure that out for the last few days. Let, 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 me, let me put it this way. Um, we're talking about church properties in East Jerusalem, for the most part. And they're anomalous um, because Israel inherited treaties that date back from the Ottoman period through the Jordanian period, which gave certain exemptions. Um, there are properties that are places of worship. There are properties that people live in that are apartments. Uh, there are schools, seminaries, etc. Uh, and it has remained a very contentious Israel issue between Israel and the churches. Uh, it's one of the major um, topics of discussion in the negotiations that have been taking place for the last 20 odd years between Israel and the Holy See. And it has never been resolved. Um, Israel has understood that if you rigorously apply the law, Israel would undermine its national interests. It would put itself on a collision course with Christendom, and it would undermine the viability of, of the churches, which we don't want. Uh, we are not talking about new legislation. We're talking about the mayor coming along and said, okay, I'm going to apply the law. And he's starting to do it. He's putting liens on accounts and things of that nature. I'm not entirely sure what this is about, but I'm willing to make a guess. <laughs> Number one, he's trying to extract more funding from the Israeli Ministry of Finance. And he's basically saying to them, if you don't cough up additional funding, I am going to um, uh, come down hard on the churches and Israel is going to be in an international crisis. That's my bet. Another possibility is that there are all sorts of issues about sale of properties by the Greek Orthodox Church. It's leverage against them. This is an issue that needs to be resolved. It can't, one of the reasons it hasn't been resolved is because most of the churches consider East Jerusalem to be occupied territory. You know, has there been a national leader in the United States with a higher Christian profile than Vice President Pence? Did you notice that Vice President Pence was not able to get any meetings with any of the Christian communities in the Holy Land? Uh, this will also need to be addressed in permanent status. It is source of grave concern, it's not a lost cause. And I think that we need to engage my government and you need to engage my government in saying the viability of Christian Jerusalem is of universal significance. You don't want to do this. My gut feeling is that there's a lot of theater in this. Having said that, I would not be complacent. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, this is the final question for today. Um, one of the repercussions of the Palestinians' response to Trump's announcement uh, was they're saying they're not going to you know, return to the negotiating table if the US is there. And then of course there was the withholding of the humanitarian assistance funding to the Palestinians through UNRWA, the UN Refugee Agency. Are there repercussions for the withholding of humanitarian aid to the Palestinians? Is that something, I mean, we are doing a lot of advocacy calling on our government to release those funds, et cetera, but would be interested to get your perspective on that. 
grasp the idea of a hum look we we are well beyond a humanitarian crisis in gaza we're in a humanitarian meltdown a humanitarian meltdown is war um i don't think that you know the humanitarian aid to gaza or the west bank is going to solve occupation but i think it's going to make pe people's lives bearable until we do causing uh, the collapse of governance, whether it be in Gaza, the West Bank, or in a refugee camp in Jerusalem, is bad for everybody. Uh, it's punitive, and it's stupid, and it's counterproductive. Um, and um, those security experts in Israel with whom I spoke are saying, does Israel really want to have direct responsibility over the Palestinians of Gaza and the West Bank? Are you kidding? Uh, but much of this conflict is being based on spite, retribution, uh, spin. Um, this is not good for anybody. And anybody with any familiarity with the issues knows that that's the case. I hate to leave you with a, a word of hopelessness, but I think us understanding the current reality is really critical. Um, any final words for us as we close? The skeptics are always right until they're wrong. That sounds like a message of hopefulness to me, Danny. Um, you it's know, the best I can come up with. <laughs> <laughs> We're going into Ash Wednesday tomorrow um, for those of us who are Christians as Lent begins and it's a time where we descend into the ashes and we enter into this spirit of grieving and lament as we wait and celebrate our church calendar you know, for ultimately what we believe is resurrection. And so my prayer is that beauty will come from the ashes uh, as we enter into Lent. Um, and there's much work for us to do and much for us to, to pray about as well. We're grateful for you. Thank you for taking the time. Really appreciate you being with us. Um, you're part one of three. So we'll be continuing the conversation. Um, but thank you so much. My pleasure. Bye-bye.